Hey you guys, welcome back to Flickers of Fear, doing some more obscure Halloween movies. So, I have to say, like, even though my formative years, you know, I was born in the early 70s, but kind of like my teenage years and stuff like that coincided with the 1980s, so that's kind of like when I grew up, I guess. And even though, as most of you know, I've always been a sucker for a good made-for-TV horror movie, I have to admit I had never heard of the 1985 movie The Midnight Hour until somebody recommended it on a live stream chat. I believe it was uh, Phantom. So this movie originally aired on ABC on November 1st, the day after Halloween for some reason, in 1985. Uh, so this movie is like a comedy horror film. It has quite an impressive cast of uh, familiar faces. You will recognize pretty much everybody in this, I feel like. And it kind of has this fun, sort of cheesy, weirdly wholesome kind of vibe to it. Um, it almost kind of seemed like a mashup of Grease with maybe like Night of the Living Dead and then maybe like Once Bitten. There's a couple scenes in there that reminded me of Once Bitten, which also came out in 1985 with a very, very young uh, Jim Carrey. So The Midnight Hour, it's not scary at all. But it's still a pretty good time if you kind of want to watch something nostalgic, very Halloween-y, and kind of relatively family-friendly, like, for the Halloween season. So this was directed by Jack Bender, and he would later go on to direct episodes of Lost, The Sopranos, Game of Thrones, like, lots of other kind of stuff. So he's kind of a big deal. So The Midnight Hour, though, it's pretty heavy on the comedy, like I said, and on some musical numbers, which we'll get into in a little bit, uh, pretty light on the horror. There are several deaths and, like, resurrections and stuff, and it does have kind of a passably spooky atmosphere with, like, lots of shots of foggy graveyards and stuff like that, which we always love. Um, I feel like the movie has a very small cult following nowadays, and it did get a like a DVD release. Um, it got a VHS release and then it got a DVD release back in 2000, I think, or 2001. But as far as I can tell, it has gone out of print and it isn't available to legally stream anywhere, which is kind of a shame. Uh, it is available on YouTube, like a, you know, kind of a bootleg of it. So go over there and check it out, like before it gets taken down. So as far as the plot goes, it's pretty straightforward. Now we're following kind of your standard group of 80s high school students. And one of them is named Phil, and he's actually played by Lee Montgomery, who as a kid was in Ben, like from the early 70s, and one of my favorite uh, haunted house movies of all time, Burnt Offerings. Um, you also have Mitch, who's played by Peter DeLuise, who I remember him being in some movies in the 80s, like Solar Babies and stuff, but he's like, nowadays he's more known as like a director and a producer. You have a woman named Mary, who's played by Dee Dee Pfeiffer, who was in Vamp and The Horror Show. I believe she's also Michelle Pfeiffer's sister um you know she looks and sounds like a lot like her then you got Vinny, who's played by motherfucking lavar burton yes of reading rainbow and star trek the next generation so that's pretty cool and then you have melissa who's played by sherry belafonte harper obviously the daughter of harry belafonte but also very famous in her own right model actress uh singer uh among other things multi-talented woman so they all live in this very stereotypical Americana small town called Pitchford Cove, Massachusetts. Uh, the way it's shot, it kind of looks like Hill Valley from Back to the Future. Might have been shot on the same set. I'm not entirely sure. And it seems like most of their families, like they've known each other their whole lives. And most of their families have been here for like many generations. So near the beginning of the movie, Phil, who's kind of like your AV geek type, but you know, a, a lovable geek, I guess. He kind of gives a presentation in class that kind of fills in some backstory about the town, right? Um, most of it regarding a witch named Lucinda Cavender, who put a curse on the town before being executed on Halloween night three centuries ago. I think it's how it went. Now, Melissa is actually Lucinda's great, 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 great granddaughter, which will kind of play into events later on a little bit. And Phil, as it happens, is also the direct descendant of town witch hunter Nathaniel Grenville, who, by the way, owned Lucinda Cavender as a slave. So, you know, I don't know if that would make your friendship awkward, like, because that was something like your ancestors did a long time ago, but I don't know. It would bother me, I guess. So it's Halloween. And after a few scenes of kind of just general high school shenanigans, like Mitch lusting after this new substitute teacher that they have, uh, this gang of lovable miscreants 
decide they're going to do Halloween upright by breaking into the town's witchcraft museum, as one does, and stealing all the clothes off the wax figures of their ancestors to wear as costumes. You know, authentic. So that's what they're going to do. Now, while they're there, you know, poking around, they find this kind of like neglected section of the building that has all kind of these neat like historical artifacts. So they decide that, you know, while they're already committing a crime, might as well go whole hog and boost all that shit too. So after this, you know, amusing jaunt into <laughs> petty larceny, they all end up at the cemetery for reasons I cannot recall now, where they open this trunk that they found at the museum. Now inside this trunk, there's a scroll and a ring that has the initials of Nathaniel Grenville on it. If you will remember, that is the witch hunter. Because these dummies evidently have not seen the evil dead, they decide they're going to recite the creepy incantation that's on the scroll because, you know, that's never come back to bite anyone on the ass or anything like that. Now, while they're doing it, like, Melissa gets, like, super, super into it and the others get kind of freaked out. But then it turns out she was just kidding. Or was she? We don't really know. So then they all leave the graveyard and they're going to go get ready for this big Halloween party that's happening later at what I think is Melissa's house. So even though they went to all the trouble of like stealing the costumes, only Mitch and Melissa like wear what they took. And Mitch didn't even bother with the pants. So he's like Puritan on top, but then like has jeans and sneakers on the bottom. So I was like, hmm, pretty low effort. Okay. Uh, and expending even less effort is Vinny, AKA LeVar Burton, who basically just wears his regular clothes, but then he just like half acidly like wraps some bandages or toilet paper or something like around his head and part of his midsection and then splatters the bandages with ketchup and raw eggs. I guess to give the whole ensemble that authentic mummy feel, because you know how mummies always had ketchup and raw eggs. And it's like, I'm watching that going, do you want ants? That's how you get ants. But yeah, I don't know. So Phil, the geeky guy, he dresses like a vampire, but with like a silver, like punk wig, I guess it's supposed to be. And then he does this weird, like geometric, like Dada-esque kind of makeup, like this kind of purple V like over his eyes. Like it's very strange. So maybe he's a glampire. I, I mean, that's kind of, I did, I was waiting for them to say that, but I was just like, they did it. And I was like, okay, well, that's what I'm going to call him. He's a glampire. And Mary claims that she's supposed to be the Bride of Frankenstein, because she's actually at this party is her unnamed crush. She was actually dressed like Frankenstein's monster. But honestly, she just looks like your kind of standard 80s movie punk chick. Like she has like a leather jacket with a bunch of chains on it, like a blue leopard print dress and completely normal blonde hair that's kind of teased up and sprayed a little bit with different colors. So not at all like the Bride of Frankenstein. And like, speaking of 80s movies and Halloween costumes, I have kind of like a small, I don't want to call it an obsession, but I have kind of like a small fascination with this. Can we like take a minute to appreciate just how fucking random like some of the extras costumes inevitably are like in 80s movies? Like, because I can kind of feel like nowadays, like people take Halloween like a lot more seriously. And if they're going to do a costume, they're going to like really do it upright. Whereas like in a lot of 80s movies, they were like, ah, it's just the extras. We'll just throw some random shit on them. You know what I mean? It's like you couldn't even figure out what they're supposed to be. I mean, in the case of this movie at this party, there are some recognizable costumes. Like there's a bunch more punks. There's a couple more vampires. There's a cow, I think. Is it a horse or a cow? I think it's a cow. Um, a ghost. There's like a majorette. I think she's supposed to be a majorette. Um, there's like a George Washington or a colonial looking dude. There's like a retro 50s chick um, and a Native American woman, which is a little bit problematic because she's like super white. <laughs> and then she, like, she has this big weird mohawk thing and i'm just kind of like all right so that's how you want to do that um but then there was like a dude that was dressed kind of like a mummy like he like his arms and his face were wrapped but then the rest of his costume was like a princess or a ballerina like he had like a tiara and kind of like a ballerina type outfit on i'm just kind of like all right whatever um and then there was a dude that like kind of looked normal but then he had like this douchey sweater like wrapped around his shoulders so i don't know if his costume was like hey fraternity shithead or something like that i'm not really sure so anyway, it's just like an observation. <laughs> it like doesn't have anything to do with the movie, really. Now, I did spot in, at this particular party in this movie, I did spot somebody in the crowd dressed like Magenta from the Rocky Horror Picture Show and the absolute best costume, I thought, the substitute teacher character from earlier that Mitch was um, lusting after. She shows up dressed like David Bowie, specifically from the Modern Love video, like when he had kind of that 
like kind of retro looking hair and he had like the yellow suit and everything like that and i was like that's badass so there is like some style going on at this party at least i'd also like to note that during the party and kind of throughout the whole movie really we occasionally hear the voice of the very very famous wolfman jack um i'm sure probably na- younger people nowadays are like who the fuck is that like he was a very very famous dj back in the day he has like a very distinctive voice So he kind of plays, you never see him, but you hear his voice a lot. Like he's playing the town's DJ and he's doing like a Halloween playlist, like over the radio, like over the course of the movie. So the songs that he plays, it's weird because this movie came out in the 80s, but most of the songs are like from the 50s or 60s, which kind of tracks because I don't know if you know, if you grew up in the 80s, it was a huge like 50s, 60s, mostly 50s, like retro nostalgia kind of thing going on. So the songs that he plays are mostly oldies. Um, and they're pretty much about what you'd expect, like, you know, Bad Moon Rising by Creedence Clearwater Revival, um, In the Midnight Hour, Wilson Pickett, obviously that's what the movie's named after, um, Clap for the Wolfman by the Guess Who, like, stuff like that. Now, the only featured songs that are contemporary with the time the film came out were How Soon Is Now by The Smiths, uh, which came out in 1984 and gets very prominently played in this movie, like, during the party and during, like, this vampire attack scene. And there was a song I believe was specifically written for this movie and it's called Get Dead and it's sung by Sherry Belafonte Harper, who's in this movie as Melissa. Um, And it has kind of like this whole thriller style dance number that happens at the party. So there's that. So anyway, getting back to the plot of the movie. So remember like how they went to the cemetery for whatever reason and read this scroll and then went to the party. So unbeknownst to the gang, their cemetery incantation worked like way better than expected because minutes after they leave the cemetery, pretty much every damn dead person in that place crawls up out of the grave and starts shambling around. Now the spell specifically said something about demons of every kind or all kinds or something like that, like something along those lines. So other than your traditional zombie ghoul type monsters, there's also at least one werewolf, because why not? Um, And Lucinda Cavender herself also resurrects, though she isn't a witch, as previously established. When she comes back, she's actually a vampire, which makes, you know, kind of no sense, but whatever, we're just rolling with it. So oddly enough, even though all the other dead folks look, you know, dead, there is one exception uh, in the form of the beautiful 16-year-old cheerleader named Sandy, who's played by Jonna Lee. Now, we later learn, we don't know this at first, we know she's dead because we see her like walking around the graveyard with all the other ghouls and she's just kind of like, huh, what's up? You know, she's not scared or anything. But we later learn that she actually died in 1959. Now, Phil, who, like I said, is a very likable, geeky dude, and he drives this sweet, like powder blue, like 50s era car. I don't know what kind of car it is. I'm not a car person, but it's like from the 50s for sure Um, with the big fins and everything. And it's powder blue. It's really, it's really cool looking. It's like a rag top. Um, so he sees her wandering around the town and kind of takes a shine to her because like I said, she's real cute and perky and everything. And he basically was like, Hey, I'm going to a party. Do you want to come with me? And she, um, doesn't go like she ends up not going, but then Phil goes to the party by himself and ends up leaving the party early because he's not getting any traction with his crush who is Mary. And Mary is after this other dude who's dressed like Frankenstein's monster. And she's just like, whatever, Phil, you know what I mean? He got friend zoned. So, uh, so there's that. So while he's, after he leaves the party and he's driving around, he runs into Sandy again and, you know, she gets in the car and they have like a little bit of a little romance kind of thing happening. Now we, as the audience, already know that Sandy is dead, but Phil is kind of clueless and he just thinks that she's been away from town a long time, hence why she thinks that there's still a malt shop on Main Street and why she still uses words like ginchy. So all the dead people from the cemetery invade the party and no one is the wiser because obviously everyone has costumes on and everyone's just like, Ooh, great costumes. You know what I mean? Oh, I have to give a shout out to, there's a little person actor in this who plays one of the ghouls and he just, he's just wearing a suit or whatever, but the makeup and shit they did on him was so great. And there's like one fucking hilarious scene where he's at the party and he's standing by the table with like the punch bowl on it. And like the look that he gives like to the geeky dude, I think it's the geeky dude, like standing by the punch bowl. And he just gives him this creepy fucking look and everything. And then he starts drinking out of the punch bowl. It's so funny. I just laughed my ass off at that scene. It was just, I was like that dude, I don't know what his name is, but man, he was, he was like made the whole movie for me. It was like so awesome. He was in it for like five seconds or something. So, uh, so yeah, so during this party, Lucinda shows up and bites 
because she's a vampire remember not a witch like they established earlier i didn't really get it i was just like why couldn't she be a witch i don't i don't know i don't know i guess because vampire stuff like spreads faster i don't know so lucinda bites melissa who remembers her great 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 granddaughter and from there melissa bites Vinny, who is her boyfriend and soon the, the vampire plague is just spreading through the party like you know a plague does now elsewhere in town mitch has this real cranky drunken asshole of a dad who's the town judge judge crandall and he's actually played by none other than kevin fucking mccarthy who was in the original invasion of the body snatchers from the 1950s um he was in twilight zone the movie he was in the burbs he's been like in a million things like he's been acting like forever so he actually gets i mean he's a real shithead in this movie. <laughs> like he's like this abusive asshole um and he gets attacked by a vampire and turns into one i guess he's supposed to be a vampire and then there's this security guard security guard dude who's constantly like spitting tobacco juice everywhere and he gets mauled by a werewolf and he later turns into a werewolf too oh and i neglected to mention that dick van patten also has a very small role in this movie um he's this very cheerful dentist who is also phil's dad um he gets turned into a vampire later too and it's actually like pretty hilarious <laughs> so by the third act of the movie pretty much the whole town and i'm not exaggerating um has turned into either vampires werewolves or generic ghouls i'm assuming um, except for Phil, who's actually been spending some alone time with Sandy. Now, Sandy has been dropping hints the whole time about her, you know, status as, like, a dead person. Um, but Phil's pretty oblivious, like I said, and doesn't really pick up on it. So, after, like, they realize all of these monsters are rampaging around, Phil tells Sandy about the stolen costumes and the whole, oh, we recited an invocation in the cemetery thing. And then Sandy somehow knows that um, to counteract the spell or get rid of all the monsters, he's going to have to reseal the scroll with wax. And the wax has to be mixed with Nathaniel Grenville's bones. Then you have to stamp the wax seal back like on the scroll like with Nathaniel Grenville's ring, which was one of the things they found in the trunk. Now Mitch is actually wearing the ring as part of his costume, so he's still at the party. So this all this stuff all has to be done before midnight. Otherwise, all of the townsfolk who have been turned into undead creatures will stay that way forever. I think that's what they said. So the climax of the movie is basically Phil and Sandy fighting through all the monster town people in order to get the ring back from Mitch and then get to the Grenville crypt in the cemetery to get the bones to mix with the wax. Now, of course, you know, it's they get surrounded and all this other stuff, but they're able to do it just right in the nick of time. And when that happens, uh, Phil finally clues into the fact uh, that the girl he has fallen hopelessly in love with, despite her, like, hanging out with her for, like, 10 minutes max, um, is, in fact, dead and has to go back to her grave along with the rest of the zombies and monsters, like, after the spell gets reversed. Um, nice thing, though, is that she is able to call Wolfman Jack from beyond the grave and dedicate a song to him. So that's pretty sweet. Now, interestingly, the end of the movie just shows Phil driving away from the cemetery in his cool-ass car with that Barbara Lewis song, Baby, I'm Yours, playing on the radio, which is what Sandy dedicated to him from, from beyond, beyond the veil. Um, now, everything has presumably gone back to the way it was before because... There was damage to Phil's car and he, the graves were all fucked up and everything like that. And everything is like back to normal. But we never get a scene showing that all Phil's friends or any of the other townsfolk went back to normal or came back to life if they were killed in the course of the evening's events. Because some of them were. Like, for example, the security guard that turned into a werewolf, like phil shot him with a silver bullet and he died so i don't know if that dude came back it's not like it would be a big loss or anything like that because that dude was kind of a shithead but it's like you know what i mean i just so i don't know if anybody came back so i suppose it's totally plausible that phil is now the only person left alive in pitchford cove which i guess will make his morning commute like that much easier at least so this movie i feel like it's not necessarily like a lost classic or anything like that but it is a pretty entertaining sort of inoffensive very affable slice of 80s halloween cheese you know what i mean um it's a lot more funny than scary as i mentioned and it does have some deaths but it's all treated in a pretty light-hearted kind of way um and like i said it's kind of a hoot like seeing 
so many familiar actors turning up. I also forgot to mention that Kurtwood Smith, who's been in a million things, probably best known for RoboCop, um, he turns up in this as a town sheriff. He's only in like two scenes and it was like really funny seeing him and he gets turned into a vampire. Everybody does. Everybody gets turned into a vampire. So it's pretty funny. Um, and as a whole, like the main characters are all like pretty likable. And, you know, it's overall, it's like a simple story. It doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense, like if you think about it too hard. And it does kind of meander a little bit in places, but it does have a really appealing, nostalgic Halloween vibe to it, like an 80s slash 50s kind of vibe. Um, so I think it would be like a great addition to any seasonal movie playlist, especially if you want something that younger kids can watch, like without getting super traumatized. Because this is, like I said, it's a pretty friendly uh, movie, even though people die in it. Um, like I said, there are a couple of, I think there's like a VHS available on Amazon, but it's like $125 or something like that. Um, so if you want to watch it, a couple of channels have put bootleg versions up on YouTube. So if you're interested in seeing it, you might want to go watch it sooner rather than later before they get taken down for copyright strikes. I don't know how long that's going to be, but you know, check it out if you really want to see it. So that will do it for this Flickers of Fear. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, please like, share, subscribe, and comment, and all of that other good stuff. And I will see you guys again on the next one. Bye.